The Houthi rebels in Yemen are accused of killing civilians and blocking aid. Is the group committing crimes in its attempt to win the war? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is the allegation that the Houthis are committing human rights abuses. Yemen's Houthi-backed foreign minister might have a lot to answer for. In a moment, he'll join me on the program to defend his self-proclaimed government against accusations by Human Rights Watch. The aid group says the Houthis' widespread use of mines in farms, villages, wells and public roads have killed dozens of civilians. And that was just last year. Human Rights Watch says those mines have also prevented people from harvesting crops in a time of famine and have blocked humanitarian organizations from delivering medical aid at a time when cholera is rampant. Well, joining me now from Sana'a is the Foreign Minister of the Houthis National Salvation Government in Yemen, Hisham Sharaf Abdullah, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Human Rights Watch came out with a report. I'm sure you're aware of it. They say you lay landmines and kill civilians under your control. They say you block aid that could help stop starvation. You're blocking it. And you want the world to recognize you as a government, but this is how you govern. What's your response to what Human Rights Watch has said? Uh, my response is very clear. Uh, if we are putting some mines in certain areas to defend ourselves from the attacks of the militias that are part of the aggression, we do it against military forces, not against civilians. We are not fighting our population. So again, human rights, should know where these things are and how the other side is dealing with us. So we are in a defensive position, not in some kind of an aggressive position. This is one. The, the two, who said we are blocking aid? Let them come to Sana'a, let them come to Hudaydah and see who is blocking okay, aid. So we let me just quote them. Okay, let me quote them directly. It, let me quote them directly then, sir, and sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Houthi-laid landmines have not only killed and yes. maimed numerous civilians, but they have prevented vulnerable Yemenis from harvesting crops and drawing clean water desperately needed for survival. Mines have also prevented aid groups from bringing food no. and health care to increasingly hungry and ill Yemeni civilians. They have killed at least 140 civilians, including 19 children, in the flashpoint governance of Hodeida and Taiz alone. They say your mines are in farmlands, villages, wells and roads. You've killed more than 140 civilians, according to Human Rights Watch. They're right, aren't they? These are general... Oh, no, sorry, I mean, to interrupt you also. These are generalized statements. Human Rights Watch should come to us and visit those areas, not only depend on the reports of the other side, who is pro-Saudi. We are not killing our people. We are defending ourselves and using some minds to defend our positions. We are not going to let them run over us and do whatever they want. Now, about the assistance, I can tell the world from here, we are not blocking aid from our citizens, from our people in Yemen. Maybe some procedures or some bureaucratic uh, arrangements made something difficult, but we are ready to solve it as the National Salvation Government mm -hmm. of the Republic of Yemen. Okay, so let's forget Human Rights Watch for a second and quote the World Food Programme. They say you block them from a grain storage, the Red Sea Mills, that is needed to serve and feed about four million people. People are starving to death in Yemen, and they're saying the Houthis are telling them, sorry, you can't come to the grain storage and you can't distribute that food to people. So Human Rights Watch aside, World Food Programme, are they also lying? Yes. I met the Director General in the region of the World Food Programme yesterday. In fact, they are not, or they were not, very, uh, I'll say, very well coated in this about us. There is a place of war, a place of battles between two sides, and that mill is in the middle. Sometimes, because of the different clashes happening, it happens at the time when they want to come to the, that mill, such things happen. But we are not preventing them. The World Food Program, I told them yesterday, we can take them there, but they know that they cannot make sure of the two sides, not our side. So the problem is mutual not from the National Salvation Government side, 
It is from both sides, the other side and us. And sometimes they try the militia, which are pro Hadi or pro the aggression coalition, they try to make it look like as if we are the ones who cannot, uh, who does not want to make them come to that mill. And again, why they make a big fuss about that mill? Well, big quantities are coming to Yemen. Because, because but it feeds again, 4 million people. Certainly. Make some, sorry, no, but again, again, please. They have hundreds of thousands of tons of grains coming to Yemen, and this is only a small part of it, and we acknowledge that it will feed a segment, a big segment of our population. So again, the WFP should make arrangements with the other side who is causing these problems, not us. You have long-range missiles that your leadership has said is trained on Riyadh and Abu Dhabi and other Gulf capitals if the ceasefire fails. Is that what you're going to do? Is that... What, what would constitute the ceasefire failing for you to launch those long-range missiles? Uh, let, let me tell you something that we have declared a long time ago, not just the last two days. We asked our brothers, the Saudis and the Emiratis and the others, to stop like the bombing of our cities. And from our sides, we will take the same uh, step. So you cannot make peace talks while the planes are right. attacking our cities and our troops. So again, we are asking them, stop your killing in our country and we will stop sending these rockets or these right. missiles to your country. Again, this is a very, very crucial point the world should know. We cannot just talk and have some kind of negotiations with the Saudis and their allies. And at the same time, they are bombing us. Okay. They have to know this. Okay. this is we war. will have retaliation. Sure. We will have retaliation. Okay. We will retaliate if anything happens to us. And this is a message clear to them. Okay. But in order to reach Riyadh, in order to reach Dubai, in order to reach Abu Dhabi, you need long-range missiles. Where are you getting the missiles from? Uh, I mean, I will leave this to military analysts to tell you, I mean, uh, how they can use these missiles. But again, uh, I have said it in are you getting different it from interviews Tehran? with CNN and BBC. No, 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 we have it. Yemen is a country that has united, I mean, Republic of Yemen, in 1990. The guys in the south had a big stock of missiles and other weapons. The guys in the north had the same. Two countries united, the same country, I mean, brothers, and we have a big stock. Are you of getting the missiles weapons, from Tehran? Including missiles. No, no, no. A long way from Tehran to here, and I can uh, confirm to you that we are not getting any missiles from Tehran, regardless of all the accusations of the Americans and their allies. Are you getting any weapons from Tehran? No. And I can tell all the world that I called the. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost the connection there with Hisham Sharaf Abdullah in Sana'a. It's a real pity that we've uh, experienced this technical problem. So I'm going to move on for now, but we'd like to invite the foreign minister back onto the program next week to finish our conversation. Her life was devoted to writing about division. But in her death, journalist Lira McKee brought political unity. Her funeral on Wednesday saw leaders from Belfast, Dublin and London together under the same roof. McKee was killed while covering a riot last week in the city of Londonderry. An Irish Republican dissident group called the New IRA took responsibility and apologised. But police are treating the incident as a terrorist attack. So is the new IRA made up of freedom fighters or terrorists? That discussion in a moment. But first, here's Haider Abbasi. We'll be praying that Lyra's death, in its own way, I commend our political leaders for standing together in Cregan on Good Friday. I am, however, left with a question. Why in God's name does it take the death of a 29-year-old woman with her whole life in front of her? The death of a 29-year-old woman with her whole life in front of her 
to get to this point. The killing of Lyra McKee has deeply troubled Northern Ireland. Political violence should have ended here decades ago, but some groups refused to put down their guns. McKee died last week after reporting on a riot in the city of Londonderry. The new Irish Republican Army says it shot the journalist. But the new IRA says it was targeting the police and that her death was accidental. Their apology hasn't satisfied many people. So it's past time now for these groups that masquerade as Republicans to pack up and pack it in. Rival political parties share the grief and outrage over Lyra McKee's killing. This is an attack on democracy. So therefore, we need to stand together and say, no, we're not accepting this. Three people have been arrested in connection with McKee's death, but they've all since been released without charge. So why are dissident groups still active in Northern Ireland? And who are the new IRA? That's a warning, it should be a clear warning. I mean, the, the politicians in England, particularly in the Conservatives, should see it as a warning. In January, a car bomb exploded outside a courthouse in Derry. Two months later, letter bombs were sent to London and Glasgow. No one was hurt. The new IRA was blamed for both incidents. The group was formed in 2012 and is comprised of former members of the real IRA and independent Republicans. But its aim is the same to form a united island, free from British control. It's considered to be the most dangerous of the dissident groups, with young and radicalised members. For 30 years, there was war in Northern Ireland. Republicans, who wanted a united island, fought unionists, who wanted Northern Ireland to remain in the UK. At least 3,500 people died in what became known as the Troubles. But peace came in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreement. One of the key provisions of the deal established a local parliament in Northern Ireland. But the ruling parties fell out two years ago and there hasn't been a government since. The main parties, the Democratic Unionist Party and Sinn Féin, disagree over issues such as same-sex marriage, the Irish language and investigating killings during the Troubles. Critics say the power vacuum has allowed dissident groups like the new IRA to thrive. Then there's Brexit. Britain leaving the European Union could mean the return of a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And that will mean the return of controls, checks and security guards at the border. For those who remember the violence of the past, such a physical border would be all too familiar. So are armed dissident groups on the rise in Northern Ireland? And could the killing of Lyra McKee be the impetus to form a new government? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now is journalist Susan McKay. She was a friend of Lyra McKee. Susan, good to have you on the program. And we're very sorry for your loss. Could you tell us a little bit about Lyra McKee and the work she did? Yeah, she was a very remarkable young journalist, Lyra. Uh, she was only 29, but she had already won quite a number of awards. Uh, her favoured form was the sort of long investigative essay, and she had recently transitioned from writing those kind of reports into doing books. She had just secured a two-book deal with a very prestigious British publisher. Um, she wrote about issues that she cared very deeply about, like youth suicide and disappearances during the troubles here and uh, she was very concerned about the way that the conflict uh, which had predated her, uh, she was only eight when the Good Friday Agreement peace settlement was made but um, she was very concerned about the shadow that the conflict had thrown over her generation of post ceasefire uh, young people and she was exploring that in her work. She was a really bubbly, 
forward looking, um, caring sort of person. Mm -hmm. She was very, she was gay and she was very involved in the LGBTQ community. Um, she would have uh, given back a lot. She would have gone back and talked to young people in disadvantaged area about how she had started out as a journalist and so on. Um, she had a huge circle of friends and a huge circle of contacts and she was just an all round very, very positive, lovely, bubbly oh. person and she was recently um, had fallen madly in love with her partner, Sarah, and they were going to get married in a couple of years time. Mm -hmm. And as we try to understand what happened and the aftermath of it, the new IRA says they didn't mean to kill her. Is it any clearer as to whether she just got caught up in the riot, in the crossfire, or she was perhaps specifically targeted because of the work she was doing? No, it's it's very clear of what happened. Um, there was a smallish orchestrated riot going on uh, with a number of young people throwing petrol bombs and fireworks at a few police Land Rovers. Uh, Lyra was one of a crowd of people who had gathered on the far side of the police Land Rovers uh, basically to watch what was happening and Lyra was one of those people who constantly photographed everything. So she had just uh, tweeted uh, a photograph saying Derry tonight absolute madness uh -huh. showing the flaring of the petrol bombs on the street and uh, she was shot so it's very clear she wasn't caught up in anything she was there watching as were quite a number of other uh -huh. civilians on a residential street in Derry and a gunman came out and recklessly started shooting towards the police vehicles mm -hmm. in the full awareness that there was a crowd of ordinary civilian people standing there. Um, people in Derry are extremely angry about this right. um, and they were absolutely horrified by the completely phony apology that was issued mm -hmm. by the new IRA's political wing uh, saying, you know, that they would try to do better next time. And people are just sort of saying, like, right. the only news we want from you, crowd, is that you're going to disband. And very finally from you, I, I was I was in Derry a few months ago. We went to Craigan Estate. We were interviewing a mm -hmm. mother of a young man who was killed in a punishment attack by the new IRA. And we were told when we went there, you mm -hmm. know, it's not safe. They might be mm -hmm. following you because she's very much out there and criticizing them openly and they'd be keeping an eye on her house and so on. And we weren't mm -hmm. absolutely sure, you know, is, is this maybe an exaggeration or not? But, and, and we were, we were wondering mm -hmm. as journalists, are we actually in danger trying to tell this story? It, it, it makes me think, you know, how on edge is the place and how much control does the new IRA have on the streets in specific parts of Craigan Estate? I think that they, the main thing that the new IRA, as they call themselves, has to fear is being rejected by the community in Craigan. I think that they are rejected by the overwhelming majority of people who live in Craigan as they're rejected by the overwhelming majority of people in Derry as a whole and in Northern Ireland as a whole and in Ireland as a whole and in the world mm -hmm. as a whole. But there is definitely a small cohort of people within Craigan who are involved in the organisation or who feel intimidated by the organisation. Like, for example, if you were a family in which one of your kids or more were involved in antisocial behaviour or were running a bit wild, you'd probably be quite scared of them because right. they do sort of see themselves as a kind of alternative policing force. So they do go around meeting out punishment beatings and shootings and so on. But um, I think that they will be seriously worried at the moment because people are cooperating with the police. Right. They call the police the occupying crown forces, but ordinary people are going to the police and, and giving evidence at the moment. So I think they must be quite concerned about that. Right. But yes. you know, it's very small groups of, of dissident very small groups of dissidents here can cause a lot of disruption. You know, it doesn't take very many people to frighten people. It doesn't take very many people to cause havoc by calling bomb scares or planting bombs outside courthouses, as these people did uh, not all that long ago, also putting the lives of, of ordinary dairy people at risk. Right. Susan, great to talk to you. I thank you so much.
for joining us here on the Newsmakers and giving us deeper insight Thank into you. who Lira was and what's going on on the ground in Derry. Let's open up the discussion. I'm joined now by Irish Senator Mark Daly, who represents the Fianna Fáil political party. And in Belfast is Neil Jarman, who's the director of the Institute for Conflict Research. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. Mark, across the border, how are you viewing this incident? Are you seeing it as an isolated incident or a sign of something bigger and more ominous? Yeah, I, I suppose Lira was, is a member and was a member of the uh, agreement generation. Those who were born just before or around and since the Good Friday Agreement, and along with two UNESCO World Chairs, who are experts in preventing violent extremism, I compiled a report on the issue of the absence of memory of harm in this, the agreement generation. Uh, and as your previous contributor said, like it doesn't take a lot of people to cause a huge amount of disruption and harm in Northern Ireland or anywhere in the world. And what our report has found is this absence of memory of harm and disadvantage in both nationalist and Catholic areas and, and loyalist and Republican areas uh, means that those young people are being radicalized uh, by people who want to achieve their own ends and are using um, all sorts of excuses, including Brexit, the possibility of a return of a hard border or a rushed border poll uh, in, in some communities as an excuse to return to violence. And there is very little support for these people. And there are very few young people being caught up in this form of radicalization. But it is happening, right. uh, and it is of concern. Neil Jarman, the fact that it's a small group of people, and I remember speaking with Seru in an undisclosed location, some of their political members, we had to you know, follow a car and go and meet them in, in some dodgy place. Um, they seem to be a small organization. They seem to be very much swimming against the tide. Do the likes of Sinn Féin and others have the ability to rein this lot in, whether it's the new IRA with their weapons or those who see themselves as a political expression like Siru, is there a way to control them? No, not, not, so, not so easily. I mean, you, you can look at the constituency who are in Siru and the new IRA as, as falling in two main groups. One is older members who probably were in the IRA or the provisional IRA or Sinn Féin at some stage and who left because they objected to the position Sinn Féin were taking, but also a younger group who are probably, you know, the millennial generation as well, uh, who have also felt that the, the peace process hasn't benefited them and have aligned themselves with this, this radical group. But even within the movement of, of the... Um, the new IRA and Saru, there's a, there's a spectrum of voices there, a spectrum of opinion, some of whom are more wedded to the gun and to military type of activity, but others who are arguing for more uh, democratic means, for political activity, for community-based activity. And you see this to some extent with the formation of Saru just over a year or so ago uh, as evidence of the, the recognition that there's need to to engage on on more public activities, to engage politically, um, so it, it's not as straightforward as seeing them as a as a single block. I don't right. think. Um, yeah. Right, Mark. Does it not worry you that even though people are cooperating with the police right now in in Derry, people are not happy that a journalist got killed? You speak to the the vast majority of people in Craig and Estate. Um, they would speak negatively about the police force, the PSNI. They would talk about them as sort of occupying forces and, and so on. They wouldn't consider, consider themselves British. Does it not suggest that there's something underlying here that needs to be sorted out? Um, and if we don't, something terrible might happen down the road. Well, I, that is the problem in the agreement generation. The, the, this absence of memory of harm is further exacerbated as a problem because both communities, both the Catholic communities and the Protestant communities, by and large, live in different worlds. They go to different schools. 95% uh, of, the, of the kids in the schools in Northern Ireland go to um, church-dominated schools. There's very little integrated education. They play different sports. They socialize differently. And only when they go to university might they meet. Uh, that's if they have the opportunity to go to university. But those who are being radicalized are those who 
have very little education opportunity, very little chance of good quality employment or housing. So the plan that has been devised and proposed in the report, which I compiled with the UNESCO chairs, but along with President Obama's senior policy advisor to the National Security Council on Counterterrorism, Michael Ortiz, he was also the first person appointed by the United States State Department on the issue of countering violent extremism. He set forth in the report a plan on how to prevent those kids who are being radicalized from being mobilized in large numbers and seeing a return to violence. So the underlying mm -hmm. issue is the same in any other society where you have deprivation, you have poverty, you have lack of opportunity. You need to give hope, you need to give educational opportunities, you need to give employment opportunities to prevent those young people being exploited by paramilitary leaders to forward their own agendas. And that has not been done in the way it should have been. And this murder is a wake up call to both the British government, the Irish government, the European Union mm -hmm. on the issues that need to be addressed in order to prevent Northern Ireland going back to the past. And from the point of view of this agreement generation, from them being exploited by paramilitary leaders, both in the nationalist community and in the loyalist community to maintain the status quo on the loyalist side and in relation to the nationalists uh, and a very small amount of people. But we must remember that when the trouble started in, in 1968 and 69, uh, it was only a very small amount of people, and then things spiraled out mm -hmm. of control. And what the governments need to do now is prevent it from spiraling out of control. Neil, is it more ideological or more gangster-like when it comes to recruiting these kids? Because, as we've heard, right, these paramilitaries, they're sometimes involved in the drug trade, sometimes they're punishing people for being involved in antisocial behavior and so on. It's a mixed bag of things. They operate outside of the law and they operate like vigilantes. Are they getting radicalized by gangsters or ideologues? I don't, I don't really think you can divide them into two categories. They're both uh, ideologues and gangsters to some extent. The Republican movement, loyalist paramilitaries have all, always relied on undertaking criminal activities to keep their movements going, to keep their activities going. So there's always been a sense of gangsterism within those two communities. Um, so I think you also, as the senator mentioned, you have to look at some of the context in the Cregan estate in Derry. It's a very deprived area. Yeah. There's not a lot of opportunity for young people. There's not a lot of expectation of doing much beyond living in Cregan in, in, a, in a place of poverty. Um, so that's an issue that underpins the, the sense of the failure of the agreement to deliver anything tangible for, for people on the ground. And to come back to a point you made earlier, which is about the attitudes to the police, you know, like um, influence, the potential influence of Sinn Féin over that community, the police have limited influence mm -hmm. over, over that community. But there's a strong disappointment for many people about policing not having delivered for that community. That um, I think attitudes to policing are going backwards in the area. There's still a strong sense that people want the police to deliver, want the type of policing that was promised under the police reforms as part of the agreement. But there are people feeling that the police are not doing what's needed for that community. And that create, creates a space for some of these groups to step in and provide some degree of discipline, some degree of control, some degree of authority on the streets to those who are involved in, in criminal activity. So mm -hmm. I think, as, as the senator said, it's very much um, a failing on the authorities to um, provide the level of services, the level of security to the Craig and, and other such areas. That, gives that space for some of the paramilitary, for the armed groups to, to survive and to prosper to some extent. Right. Senator Daly, when we look at the capabilities of the new IRA, are they capable of doing something truly ghastly on a massive scale, something on the scale of the Omar bombing, for example? Do they have those capabilities? I mean, since the beginning of the year, they have been responsible for the bombing outside the courthouse, which um, could have led to a large loss of life. And um, so the capacity is certainly 
growing and the ability is 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 there and unfortunately they they have a knowledge and an expertise um, that they can utilize to affect and what they're trying to provoke is a reaction and they want uh, the police and the army and the British Army to overreact and therefore garner more support. It's exactly what happened in 1969 and the 70s and the 80s. So the lesson has to be learned from that. But really, the long term solution is within the young people, making sure that they interact across the community divide um, between the two religions. And that takes long term investment and mm -hmm. takes money. But it also takes a will by both sections uh, of the community and the political will. Mark Daly and Neil Jarman, I have to move on, but I'd love to I'd like to thank you for joining us here on the Newsmakers. After the break, we look ahead to Spain's election this Sunday. We ask a member of the anti-immigrant Vox Party why they think they'll be getting a big show of support at the ballot box. It was a widely mocked campaign video. Vox Party leader Santiago Abascal is seen leading a posse on horseback, gloating of a reconquest of Spain. Now no one is laughing. The anti-immigrant, anti-feminist party sent shockwaves throughout Spain's political spectrum when it won a dozen seats in Andalusia's local elections last year. Abroad, it was cheered on by KKK leader David Duke and France's Marine Le Pen. And now the first far-right party to get a political foothold in Spain since Franco is forecast to win around 30 seats in the federal parliament in Sunday's elections. How would they govern? In a moment, we'll be joined by a Vox Party official. But first, Natalie Perhernan has this report. On Sunday, Spain will have its third general elections in four years. But this time around, the political landscape has shifted. The Socialist Party, headed by Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, is leading in the polls, but the numbers also suggest no party will win enough votes to govern alone. The rise of the far-right party Vox has resulted in a split on the right of the political spectrum. With just days left until the elections, one survey suggests up to 40% of voters remain undecided. All of which means this will likely be one of Spain's most tightly contested races in decades. In December, Vox won 12 seats in Andalusia's regional election. It was the first time the far right had secured victory at the ballot box since the end of the Franco dictatorship in the 1970s. The results of the election in Andalusia, Spain's most populous region, reflect the political fragmentation in the country. For decades, two parties dominated. Those on the left voted for the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party. Those on the right, the People's Party. Only recently have the centre-right Ciudadanos or Citizens' Party and the far-left Podemos Party entered Spanish politics. Now Vox has found space on the far right. The major parties have tended to focus more on keeping Spain a unified territory than bread and butter campaign issues like the economy. The country is still dealing with the fallout from Catalonia's failed secession bid in 2017. How best to unite the nation remains a divisive and emotional issue for many. Here are the leaders of the two major parties at the final debate before election day. El independentismo y las derechas ¿Saben que la independencia no se va a producir? ¿Saben que no se va a producir? ¿Saben que el problema en Cataluña no es la independencia? El problema en Cataluña es la convivencia. La convivencia. Y por tanto, ¿nosotros qué es lo que estamos proponiendo? Ante un problema de convivencia, lo que tenemos que hacer es dialogar dentro de la Constitución. ¿Qué es lo que ha hecho este gobierno? Bueno, la unidad de España... The unity of Spain is at risk, and the socialist government of Pedro Sánchez is to blame. It's really simple. The ones who want to break Spain, they have Sánchez as their favorite candidate. Vox's leader, Santiago Abascal, wasn't at the debate because only the four biggest parties are allowed to take part. But he's been a constant presence in this campaign. The status of Spain cannot be discussed or be part of talks or negotiated. The unity of Spain must be defended until the end. 
This is a country where people often identify themselves by their region instead of their nationality. The question now is which party or combination of parties most reflects the Spanish people. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Let us begin our debate now. Joining us is Vox National Bureau member Ivan Espinosa de los Monteras, Luis Arroyo, who was an advisor to former Socialist Prime Minister Jose Zapatero, and Carlos Conde Solares, a senior lecturer in Hispanic Studies at Northumbria University. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Luis, for those who say this is going to be the most contentious election in four decades in Spain, are they accurate? I wouldn't say that is the, the, the most contentious. I would say that is the most uncertain. Mm. Uh, surveys are saying that there's no majority either in the right side of the political spectrum or the uh, left side. And uh, so we, we, will, we will not know the results until Sunday, probably very late at night in the Sunday. Okay, so Ivan, from the outside looking in, some are saying, well, this election's so crazy that you have the far right to admire Franco who want to come to power or at least make a dent in the politics. Is that an accurate description of your party? No, oh, not of my party. I thought you were talking about some, some other party. No, no, Vox is a very reasonable, uh, moderate, catch-all party. And um, I think Luis is right in saying this is going to be a very open and a predictable election. There is, for the first time ever, there's going to be five uh, fairly large national parties in contention. I do believe that the uh, Everything that's to the right of the left is going to be uh, adding more votes, adding more seats in Parliament. But it is open for discussion. It's not clear. And we will see mm -hmm. on Sunday night, as we was correctly pointing out, quite late at night. I am extremely hopeful um, about our chances, about Vox's chances in these elections. And I think we're going to be uh, the big story for the night. Okay, so Carlos, a party like Vox got 12 parliamentary seats in Andalusia. Do you think that they can actually scale that up nationally because of the sentiment of voters at this moment in time? Uh, I think that they are going to do um, better than they did in Andalusia. And indeed, I think that they are going to do much better than current opinion polls uh, seem to be suggesting. When you look at the fine detail of all polls, perhaps the most uh, remarkable part of those is the very large percentage of undecided voters. Uh, I do believe that within that, uh, well, it varies between 25%, 40% of undecided voters. I do believe that there is a large proportion of potential box voters in that um, mm -hmm. in that bag of voters. So I, I do think that they are going to do uh, really well. Uh, whether or not uh, that impact is going to be enough to create a um, center-right majority, I'm not sure. And I don't think anyone can be sure, but I do believe that the impact uh, that Vox are going to have in this election is going to uh, perhaps uh, send shock waves around uh, Europe and beyond after Sunday. Yeah. Right. The polls are saying that 40% of voters are still undecided. Luis, why do people want to turn to parties like Vox? First, I would like to say that, that in, in any case, and the box case is a success case, there's no doubt. It doesn't matter if they get 20, 40, or even 60 seats. Uh, they are new in the parliament, they will be new in the parliament. There's no doubt that they will come to the parliament. Uh, it's the first time that we have a, a far-right party in our parliament, and in, and in any case, they will have that success. It's uh, Obviously, Ivan doesn't want to call himself uh, far-right. No one wants to call himself uh, or herself far-right. But all the headlines in the world will say on Monday that the far-right arrived to the uh, Spanish parliament for the first time in our history. Why do people want to vote, to vote Vox? Well, they are probably... Um, angry about the recession that the the extreme recession that we have economic recession they are uh, very angry also because of the situation of catalonia the independentist uh, uh, challenge in catalonia they felt that the political the uh, the popular party the right uh, didn't do it well and, and and they want they want a strong government that uh, that has uh, supposedly uh, the answers to those uh, challenges, economic and uh, territorial. I think those are the basic axes uh, for the, uh, uh, the box voter. Okay, so Ivan, you would agree that was a fair analysis from Luis, but you're still far right, aren't you? You have kindred spirits across oh. 
the continent who would consider themselves far right who would be supporting you? Look, we're the right because we're not the wrong. The wrong in Spain has been the left. The wrong in Spain has been separatism in Catalonia. The wrong in Spain has been progressives who have made, have done a lot of damage to our country. And I think there's people from all walks of life that are going to be voting for us for very different reasons. I think Luis is correct in pointing out that the uh, separatist challenge in some parts of Catalonia has been mishandled by uh, the traditional parties, both uh, socialists and so-called conservatives. And I think that's one of the main drivers in this, in this election uh, that is helping us. And the other is because, you know, we do defend the unity of Spain and we do defend freedom. And now freedom is also being challenged by the so-called socialists and the so-called conservatives. And so I think the platform that we're running on, and again, mm -hmm. it's the unity of a nation that's been together for 500 years, probably Europe's oldest nation. That's one. And then the other, the defense of freedom, uh, both personal freedom, certain collective freedoms. I think those are two uh, classical platforms that run across uh, different party lines. I don't think you will be able to say, if you come to one of our rallies, you will see very different people, people from okay. different walks of life. We have people from, from very different social and economic backgrounds. And I think what you will see is that uh, for the first time in maybe 35 or 40 years, there's a lot of people who are coming to vote with a smile. There's a lot of people who are uh, deeply uh, with a strong, strong sense of pride okay. uh, of defending their national unity, of defending their freedoms. And I think that's going to be driving a, uh, an enormous amount of votes for, for Vox this coming Sunday. So, so Carlos, those people that Ivan calls the so-called the so-called socialists and the so-called so conservatives, center-left, center-right, for 40 years they've been running the show. What is going on? What allowed us to get to this point where we find the, the middle being hollowed out and people turning either to people like Podemos or to, to Vox? Well, first of all, I don't think that the middle is being uh, hollowed out. If we look at the uh, if we look at the numbers and if we look at the polls in Spain, uh, Spain, I would say, is perhaps less polarized than, um, than other European nations where we have, for instance, in France, uh, the Front National uh, already being perhaps the second biggest party, if not the biggest party in uh, France, where uh, if we look at nations like Italy, where you have the Lega Nord, and where you have the Cinque Stelle uh, already dominating uh, the Italian government. I don't think Spain is more polarized than other countries. On the contrary, I think that it is perhaps less polarized. Uh, what I would say is that the, um, the far-right labels that are being given to Vox in order to put them in the box of other new parties in Europe is not particularly helpful in my view, because this is a phenomenon that is specifically Spanish. And um, what really defines Vox is the Catalan crisis of 2017. Um, right. Quite often, these new parties are explained away because of the atomization of, um, of uh, politics after the systemic crisis of 2008 and all the rest. But I think that that gap was already plugged by the austerity party, the far left uh, Podemos. Mm -hmm. um, Vox have been in existence since 2013, but they, haven't, they have only caught flight really uh, last year in 2018 after uh, the Catalan crisis. So I think that it is a very specific right. Spanish phenomenon and one that is very difficult to compare okay. with others. So, so Luis, if, Luis, if we can say that Rajoy messed up his response to the Catalan crisis, they had the vote, Rajoy responded, there were people on all sides who weren't happy with the way he responded for multiple reasons, there's a new government. But the socialists came in less than a year ago. Why have they not been able to be the anti-Rajoy? Why are they seemingly going to lose power when it comes to this? Oh, no, no. First, the, the socialists are going to be the most voted. Uh, uh, according to, to surveys, they, they will be the most voted. The, the socialist party is going to be, again, is going to be the winner. Of but this well, short first, of well short of a majority. Well short of a majority. Well, we will see. We will see. Uh, mm -hmm. We will see. There's a, the, obviously, they, they will not have a, 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 a sufficient majority to, to be able to govern by themselves, but no one will be able to do it. Uh, but let me tell you a couple of things. First, it's not only a Catalonian thing. Vox is against uh, the laws of the women. It's against immigration. It's an, basically anti-European. Anti it's, it's clearly... It's not because I, because I say it, it's because everybody knows that, that Vox is a far-right party. It doesn't matter if you like the label or not, it's the label that everybody is giving to the party. Uh, second thing, it's not true that, that, that they have people coming from everywhere in the spectrum. No, most of the people that come to, to, to vote to Vox come from the very, uh, the, the very right of the popular party. That's what the surveys say. It's not that I say it, it's what the surveys with the data say. 
Um, uh, so it's not only a matter of Catalonia. Catalonia is a big issue here, of course, but there are other issues in which Vox and, and obviously the rest of the parties are aligning themselves. And all the positions that Vox adopts coincide with the far right in Europe. There's no doubt, there's no way <laughs> to ignore that. Uh -huh. So it's not only a matter of Catalonia, it's also a matter of their position, of their political and ideological positions. Ivan? You see, Imran, the problem with surrounding yourself with people who think like you, talk like you, look like you, live in neighborhoods like you, and that's the problem that Luis has, is that you believe that everybody, that's a word he uses, everybody knows this, everybody says that, everybody's writing so well, if you're surrounded by people who are exactly like you, then you're prone to believe it's, it's that what, everybody thinks like you. Unfortunately said. for him, I mean, Ivan, that's not the case. What, so if you look across Spain, you will see that this is exactly the opposite of what's happening. We're seeing people from all walks of life. We're seeing very modest people. We're seeing people who've been left that, behind Ivan, that's simply by the so-called progressives. What we've seen Ivan, Ivan, is that the I socialists have been governing much, for the elites. They have, they have this this policy of governing for very specific elites, for very specific, heavily subsidized with taxpayers' money elites that protect and defend certain elites within the society. Ivan, and that's what happens you're, you're, when you I mean, lose your party, uh, when you lose your, your touch party with your base. The party of that's the exactly what's happening. What you Luis can, you is can saying repeat it, is exactly, you can repeat it as he's the, as he's you the want. definition, I he is the epitome of what's not going that, on wrong in Spain. Not true. It's all not the true. journalists in Spain I'm and all the progressive analysts are in fact saying what Luis is saying. If that were true, if what Luis is saying was true, then yes, we would be getting two to three percent of the vote on Sunday. However, if we're getting a double digit, no, you're number, getting I'm not no, you're getting half we'll of the Sunday night. Half of that's your vote. probably votes. true. It's probably true that what we're saying is uh, applicable to people from all walks of life and not those extreme right, which uh, Luis is appealing to. I think Carlos has has hit the nail on the head. This is a very specific situation which we have in Spain. What's going on it's, here is not comparable Ivan, to other it's European simply, countries it's, or other countries around the world. And unfortunately, sorry. even though yeah, Luis no. likes to dumb it down and simplify it for people, because he believe people can make up their own opinions, unfortunately things are not the way Luis is, is pinning them. Luis? It's just unfortunate for him that it's not well, the case. Well, okay, just, just, no, it's just, just to make it clear, it's just a matter of seeing the numbers. Ivan knows the numbers better than me, probably better than me. And it's a matter of just checking what your positions are in every single issue. It's as simple as that. It's, again, it's not... The, yes, please, you but can, when you, you check, them, check them, with reality. Don't you check them you can with your friends who, you who write are. the same you can things that you believe Ivan, in Ivan, papers Ivan, let that me, you read. No, no, excuse me. Excuse me. Let me, let, let me end. No, no. Let, let me end. Just a second. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, it's just a matter of seeing the numbers. Who do you receive the votes from? which is basically 90% from the PP, obviously, obviously. And second thing, huh. checking all Luis, your positions, you know all of them, Look. if you list all of them. And it's okay. as simple Finish as that. So you, sure. I'm, I understand okay. that you don't like to be called the far right, but you guys are the far right. No, and we it, don't and it, care about mean, labels. But Luis, you are, you're a serious analyst, it's and you, my fault. you know the numbers as well. If you look at what happened, finish off, finish off. You are a politician. Okay. If you I look at what happened in Andalusia, you are a politician, and you can deny you can deny the labels precisely. that we could, that's that we precisely. put. That well, but so far, I'm a professional. I'm not even a, I'm not even a politician. Okay. Political scientists and analysts need labels, and your label is far right. Okay, okay. that's the label okay. you have. Okay, and that's, no, that's what the you will okay. receive okay. from okay. because you're an analyst. Ivan, briefly, Ivan, let's look at. Sorry, yeah, you know, let's not talk about the future. Let's look at what happened in Andalusia. In Andalusia, forty percent of the vote that Vox got did not come from either Populares or, or Ciudadanos. So 15 came from former voters of Socialists and Podemos. 15% came from people who were not voting, people who stayed at home last time. 15? And 10% came 15%. from people who were what, young, what so the young 80, that it was the first time they were voting. So okay, so, okay. 15, what about the 15 from the left, 15 right. from okay. their own, 15%. and 10% new voters. 15. That's Ivan, 40%. 15. Can I, and the other 15. 60% 15. come from different parties. Can Less I grab hold of this for 10. a second and, and go to Carlos? Because I'm okay. going to ask All right. Carlos. No, no, I agree. I agree. 15%. Okay. 15%. Okay, what you're in agreement the over the 15. Okay. Carlos, let's grab hold of that for a second. 15, 15, and 10. It's a total of 40. Let's unpack it for a second, Carlos. Carlos, what does this exchange that we've heard for the past few minutes tell us about the issues as we look at that upcoming election? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, this is perhaps just uh, anecdotal evidence, but I come from, uh, from a predominantly uh, working class uh, neighborhood. 
uh, and city where uh, most of the people traditionally have voted for the left. And my impression is that a lot of those people this time are going to vote for Vox. They are not former uh, Partido Popular voters at all. They are not uh, former Ciudadanos voters at all. Uh, this phenomenon is much more uh, transversal, I believe, than, um, than uh, Mr. Arroyo is saying. And uh, it responds to, um, as we mentioned earlier, what is taking place. I mean, this is a movement that doesn't quite appeal to the disenfranchised in the way that uh, Trump or the Leave campaign in the UK appealed. But it appeals perhaps to people who are territorially disenfranchised. And I'm talking about the autonomous communities and the provinces and the places that nobody's talking about. OK, listen, we'd love to have you all back on the show, especially after the vote. It's difficult to figure out what's going to happen because, as was mentioned, almost half of voters polled are undecided. Those who were polled suggest that the socialists will probably win, but short of a majority, which means coalitions, which means it could get messy and interesting. Look for, looking forward to talking to all of you after the elections. Thanks for joining us on The Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching. Bye bye.